Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the eight hour chart of silver. I've drawn a number of things in here. The most important, of course, is the primary trend line. And I pointed out the last time uh, before we got this rally that the trend line was holding. You can see we got a pretty good rally and then a big sell off. And uh, we're now apparently going to go back down and test this line, although that's not certain. Now you can see here the pennant that's forming. It's a, a fairly large pennant. And I wanted to show you based on the last pennant that we had, uh, normally when you have a pennant formation and a breakout, uh, the most normal pattern in a bull market is to have a test of the breakout point of the pennant. So you can see right there we broke out and we rallied all the way from about $15.75 to $18. The correction came right back down to the breakout point and then we took off. Now this pennant that we're currently in is a little bit different. You can see the breakout point is at $18 and we significantly dropped below that point. We didn't take out the trend line but uh, we did uh, go significantly below the breakout point. And so now the question is going to be, are we going to break below the trend line? And uh, is this pennant going to fail? Now, my best guess is, yes, it's going to fail. The, the main reason I say that is because we're going into that time period that we watch every year now, which is the December period for the Silver Eagle where the mint stops producing them. They're not available to be bought. And we've seen in the past that uh, the market tends to make a low when the coins aren't available. So what type of price is that predicting? Well, it's, it's most likely predicting a price of around 16 or 15.75. Uh, the 1575 price is based on this old top of this breakout and uh, the, the 1625 price is uh, based on just a percentage breakdown from this trend line. So if we get that, and also you have to note this MACD spike that we have here attempting to roll over, now, if you look at the formation of this, uh, that type of thing normally uh, is, is not that bearish. The, the most bearish sorts of uh, tops in the MACD that you see are rounded over ones. But uh, where you have ones like this where there's a spike and it's a sharp one, you can get a continuation trend. So that is possible. But... I'm going to say that based on historical trends and what we've seen in the past, that we're probably going to get a nice plunge down into the 16 somewhere price range during that mid to late December period and that ultimately this pennant is going to fail. That's going to change the technical picture completely and we'll assess that when it happens. Now let's jump over to the Bitcoin chart. There's a lot going on with Bitcoin. You can see that Bitcoin in the Chinese Yuan, and we're going to talk about the zero hedge article here in a second. Uh, the Bitcoin price in the Chinese Yuan is testing this 5,000 price. You can see the high was 5180 in the Chinese Yuan, and it came close to that at about, uh, I think it was. 51.50 so we're 51.80 51.50 and we got a big big smackdown that occurred you can see this volume spike that red spike you can see there that's the largest volume spike we've seen since um, July of 2015 so there's some serious selling coming in that doesn't mean that this is going to fail I've drawn two trend lines in here. The primary trend line you can see is all the way down here at 4,000. Uh, the secondary trend line is up around, going to be around 4,500. 
So a bounce off of either one of those is going to mean that the trend is intact. But uh, there's a, a very large chance, given this volume, that there's going to be some serious testing of these uh, as, as Bitcoin tries to go into new highs. And of course, we know that the larger picture is that uh, we're coming up to approaching these uh, ultimate highs that we had all the way up at $1,200 per Bitcoin, which is quite a ways off price-wise, but actually technically is not that far off. You can see if we do a line from uh, below the congestion area, and that's just going to be uh, the area where there was violent trading back and forth. Um, to get steady prices above a congestion area means that you're definitely in uh, a sort of uptrend. So we're right near a critical point here. We've had two tests now, and you can see that the projected time frame is going to be about March of next year, March or April, May of next year, to, to get a true test to see if we go through that. So let's look at that Zero Hedge article here about what's going on with Bitcoin in China. China prepares to impose curbs, capital controls on Bitcoin. Now, I do not believe that uh, any government in the world is really going to have an effective policy against Bitcoin. I've said from the very beginning what I believe Bitcoin is, and I think that Bitcoin is probably going to be very similar to email. We know that people don't communicate by sending letters anymore. It, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, email has completely supplanted the postal system. Uh, it's just a dinosaur that's waiting to die. It, it creates a lot of jobs for people, so they're, they're still supporting it with uh, worthless ad flyers and things like that. But the, the reality is that email has completely supplanted uh, the postal system as far as the ability to communicate. And it, it doesn't even make any sense to think about why that's the case because you can communicate very, very quickly with email. And to compare email to traditional letters is, is beyond absurd. I think that something like that is going to happen with cryptocurrencies and uh, the central banks. I know that's an unthinkable thing, but again, to think that all of the post offices of the world would become irrelevant was also unthinkable at a point. So let's read a little bit of this. China prepares to impose curbs, capital controls on Bitcoin. Last September, when we predicted that Chinese consumers, investors, and savers would flock to Bitcoin as a medium of facilitating capital outflows, it was trading at 230 then, it's now three times higher. We also warned that Bitcoin's upside would be ultimately capped by Beijing when China's authorities realized how the digital currency was being used to bypass capital controls and launch a crackdown on Bitcoin, as they have with most other capital outflow measures. It appears that the time has come because, as Bloomberg reports, China's regulators are studying measures to limit transactions that use Bitcoins to take funds out of the country, citing people familiar with the matter. According to Bloomberg sources, Chinese officials are considering policies including restricting domestic Bitcoin exchanges from moving the cryptocurrency to platforms outside the nation and imposing quotas on the amount of Bitcoins that can be sent abroad. Now, uh, it makes sense that uh, they may place regulations on exchanges. It doesn't make any sense about quotas on how many Bitcoins you can send abroad. They simply have no control over that. That obviously has to be a bluff. Further indicating that Chinese regulators were just a little bit behind the curve, they allegedly noticed only recently that some investors bought Bitcoins on local exchanges and sold them offshore, evading rules on foreign exchange and cross-border fund flows. The report further reveals a quick look at the uncanny correlation between the decline in the yuan and the rise 
in Bitcoin confirms that the digital currency has indeed been largely used to invade capital, uh, evade capital controls. So that's all I'm going to read of that. Um, uh, I don't completely agree with this. Uh, I don't think that China really has any control over Bitcoin. I don't think that any government of the world has any control over Bitcoin. And it's true that if they crack down on exchanges and especially bank transfers where people can directly link bank accounts to Bitcoin exchanges and transfer the currency uh, directly in, that if they crack down on that and it becomes a local Bitcoin solution, then obviously the flow of money into Bitcoin will be slowed. Is it going to change things in the long term? No, it's not going to change anything. Uh, central bankers are dinosaurs. They're, they're going to go the way of the dodo bird. Uh, their time is over and, and cryptocurrencies prove that uh, their time is over. You can see that in this comment here. Several Chinese government bodies, including the People's Bank of China and the financial regulators, said in a joint notice that year that Bitcoin functioned like a digital commodity without the legal status of a currency. The central bank said in January it is studying the prospects of issuing its own digital currency and aims to roll out a product as soon as possible. So you can see this is one of those things that they can't beat them, so they have to join them. There's absolutely no way that governments can stop uh, cryptocurrencies. And I said this from the very beginning, but it takes a very, very long time for these things to be fleshed out. And that's what's happening now. Now, I want to talk about this, also this Zero Hedge article about government pensions. And uh, this is something that's a long time coming. It's a story uh, that I've covered a lot, but it's a, a brewing crisis. It's going to be a tremendous crisis when it hits because they have promised more than they can deliver. And uh, there are so many flaws in the way they do things, including the calculation of the returns, the percentage of uh, people who are involved, the uh, amount of uh, contributions that are made by particular people. Uh, it's it's just a, a crisis that is is coming very, very quickly. So let's read a little bit of this, and then I'm going to show you a chart of what I think is uh, uh, going to pretend the end of this thing. So this is government pension plans are headed for disaster. This is Robert Fellner of the Von Mises Institute. The combined debt held by U.S. public pension plans will soon top $1.7 trillion, according to a just-released report from Moody's Investor Services. This pension tsunami has already forced towns like Stockton, California, and Detroit, Michigan into bankruptcy. Perhaps no government mismanaged their pension as badly as Puerto Rico, where a $43 billion pension debt forced the Commonwealth to seek protection from the federal government after having defaulted on its obligations to bondholders, a default which is expected to spread to retirees in the form of benefit cuts. While the disastrous outcome of Puerto Rico's pension plan, which is projected to completely run out of assets by 2019, represents the worst case scenario, the same series of events that led to its demise can be found in most public pl pension plans nationwide. There are three primary culprits that can be found in nearly every state suffering from a public pension crisis. One, the use of accounting gimmicks. Two, lawmakers acting in their self-interest. And three, a broken governance structure where public pension board members are actually penalized in tangible ways for acting responsibly. So this all ultimately gets down to the 0% interest rates that we have and how there is no way that they can produce the returns that they're projecting based on the current interest rates. And we know that a lot of pensions had a sort of fiduciary rule where they had to be invested in things like bonds. We know those were loosened to include uh, B-rated bonds and then ultimately C-rated bonds, D-rated bonds, uh, junk bonds, chasing that higher yield uh, with lower quality. But I wanted to show you a chart here of 
some stocks and this is two of the big performers here and I think it's going to come out when this thing turns the other direction. Uh, how large of a percentage that the pension funds have in these stocks. Now we know that although they have very high projected returns, we also know that they've been doing remarkably well. Um, many of them are projecting 8% returns and some have recorded as much as 5 and 6% returns. Now we know there's no way that those pension funds could be investing in government treasuries, uh, any kind of municipal bonds or anything like that. They, they can't be investing in interest rate uh, securities because those returns just don't exist. So we know uh, by a matter of uh, the process of elimination that they have to be investing in equities. And the only thing that has had the, the amount of returns that uh, could make up for the shortfall that we've had in uh, the interest, uh, interest rate uh, area is equities. So we know government bonds are returning less than 1%, uh, whether it's uh, federal or even state, uh, some municipal are down below two. Um, so we know that their money is in stocks and these two stocks are a perfect example of what we had since the financial crisis. You can see here, this is a cross of Netflix and Amazon and uh, it doesn't go back to 2000, but it goes back to 2003 and you can see that starting in the fall of 2008, where we were at the uh, m very middle of the financial crisis and the money printing was just starting, uh, that's when these two stocks took off. So you can see on the left-hand side, we have a price of roughly 25 to 30, we'll just say 30. And you can see we went all the way up to 767 here. We're talking about a 20-fold return or so on that stock. You can see down here uh, on the other side, we've got a price of about 5 and we've got a price of about 120. So we're talking about a 25-fold return uh, hundreds and hundreds of percents of return. Now, the other thing I want you to see here is that this uh, trend line is fairly stable all the way up until about uh, summer of 2015 and that's where we get this blast off outside of the trend and uh, we're all the way up here much, much higher than the trend line. And just a simple correction back to the trend line, uh, which is uh, not that much in terms of percentage or price, is going to mean a tremendous drop in the returns of the people who are uh, holding these stocks. Now, if we get a true bear market, which would mean a test of this, probably a break below it, and then of course that long, long term decline all the way back down probably to here, possibly even down to here where we began. Uh, that is going to completely bust the pensions, which I believe have been for the most part piling into stocks uh, as Andy Hoffman calls it, the Dow propaganda average these major stocks that have billions and billions of dollars invested in them, they, when they crater, you're going to see numbers coming out of these pension uh, plans that are going to shock you because we know just by a process of elimination that they must be in these high performing equities because they're still reporting returns above 5%. That's the only way they can report those kind of returns. So. Back to the silver chart here, uh, we're still in that uptrend. The uptrend line is holding and we've got uh, the 
resistance line coming down, uh, forming a pennant, but my money is on the seasonal factor that they're going to drop the price dramatically when they stop issuing the Silver Eagles. There's going to be a period there where there is a very, very good price for buying silver, a good stacking point, but the question is what will be available to stack at that time? And we'll talk to you next time.